welcome to the Center Podcast. I'm Edouard Machery. I'm, I'm a professor of philosophy in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm also, also the director of the Center for Philosophy of Science. Today, our guest is Arnon Levy. Arnon, would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, hi, thanks. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Arnon Levy, as, I, as Edouard just said. Um, I'm uh, associate professor at the Hebrew University uh, of Jerusalem in the Department of Philosophy. Uh, Am and I'm senior visiting fellow this year at the center. We've been really happy to uh, have you here at the center, and thanks for joining us today to this episode of our podcast. Today, our plan is to discuss uh, the place of uh, values in uh, science, and this podcast is recorded in anticipation of the conference that Arnon is organizing at the Center for Philosophy of Science in April, uh, from April 5 to April 7. The conference is called Revitalizing Science and Values. Um, as the name suggests, the key idea of the uh, conference is to maybe challenge, and that might be the right word, uh, the consensus behind, the consensus about science and values in the philosophy of science and to try to move the debate toward new uh, grounds. Um, so we, 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 we hope you'll be interested in, in the conference as well. So Anand, um, what do you think is the consensus at this point among philosophers of science about the place of values in science? Um, yes, thanks. So you're right about the general uh, th thought about the, the conference. Um, there's not a universal view about what values, you know, what roles values should play in science, but I would say that over the last um, 20 years maybe, there's been an increasing tendency to view science as um, both descriptively and normatively value-laden, that is, both as in, in fact uh, driven by values, and here values um, primarily refers to moral, political, social uh, considerations and uh, influences, and also an increasing tendency to view that as the appropriate state of affairs, uh, the right way for science to function uh, and proceed. This maybe should be noted was not the mainstream view, I think, for many years, both in philosophy of science, uh, perhaps uh, also in science. Uh, I think there's less sort of clear information about that. And to a large extent also in sort of the world, in the way in which the scientific community and scientific institutions interact with science. So I think there's been a, a kind of interesting shift um, in, in the consensus. Also, by the way, in the, the volume of work on this. So this has been a big, a big area of, of debate and, and discussion, and a lot of it has moved in the, generally speaking, value-laden direction, I, I would say. And so what has led many philosophers of science, and maybe some scientists, I'd like to hear about, maybe there's a difference of opinion here between scientists and philosophers of science, but what has led many philosophers of science, and maybe some scientists, and maybe some STS people, to uh, the view that, on the one hand, values m are actually influencing science, and also maybe that they should influence uh, the practice of science. Right. I, I mean, there's there's several uh, different uh, trends involved. Um, I, I'm most familiar with the philosophical side of things, and and so I'll maybe focus on that. Um, I think there there one big tendency has been. Um, the growth of feminist philosophy of science, uh, feminist philosophy in general, feminist epistemology and philosophy of science in particular, uh, which has emphasized what feminists usually call the situated um, nature of knowledge and of knowing. Basically the idea that uh, to know something is to stand in a certain relationship to it, which is um, to a large extent determined and influenced by who the knower is, what their situation in the world is, what their uh, set of motivations, values, um, and other, other kinds of knowledge, assumptions about what knowledge is and how it works uh, is. And from that perspective, it's pretty much a given that one's values will enter into the generation of knowledge and what ultimately gets known and, and, and why. So that's been, uh, I think, a big trend in generally in epistemology, in, in particular in this context. There are other sources, though. Uh, reflection on um, the um, nature, especially of, of concepts in of concepts, and especially in social science, has been a big influence here. So, a bunch of authors have emphasized the idea that 
for instance, when you come to measure and evaluate uh, various uh, social scientific quantities, then there's just sort of seemingly no obvious way of doing that without presupposing something about what is to be measured and as a consequence, what uh, should be measured, what is valuable. So if you measure uh, uh, gross national product, you need to measure it making certain assumptions about what the national product is, who are the consumers, how um, the uh, consumption of different parts of society uh, is to be weighted and compared. Um, but so, so this is, some people call this uh, uh, the relevance of thick concepts. People call that those concepts thick ones in the sense that they're not just sort of simply sort of quantitative kind of in a thin sense, but involve a kind of you know, embody a set of values. That phenomenon probably occurs outside of social science, although I think it's most acute in philosophy of science. So that's been another source. And maybe a final thing that's worth mentioning here, there are other sources, but a final thing that's worth mentioning here is uh, what is sometimes called the argument from inductive risk, uh, other times the error argument, which suggests basically, we can talk more about this if you'd like, but basically suggests that every time you make a scientific judgment, there's a risk of error, and errors trade off against each other. And you can make different kinds of errors and those errors will trade off against each other. And in order to set that trade off and to balance the chance of making certain errors, something other than evidence needs to um, come in. And many people think that other thing should be value judgment, should be how you value in particular different sorts of errors, different uh, possible outcomes that depend on those errors and so on. So I'd say those are three big Yes, that seems um, right and, and uh, covers quite a lot of ground. I had a question about the first um, uh, trend that you uh, singled out, uh, the role of feminist philosophy of science, and I, I, I do agree that that has been uh, an, an influence in the growth of the debate about the place of values in science. My question was whether that approach um, um, can really establish Details matter, of course, here, but the broad ideas can really establish that values should matter in science. I mean, so it definitely really shows that values do matter of science in, in what we do, or our epistemic practices are driven by who we are, which I think is in some ways undeniable. It might establish that values must matter in science. Uh, we, we maybe cannot escape who we are. It's a little bit unclear whether it establishes that values should matter in, in, in science. We must still have the regulative ideals that despite the fact that we cannot escape of who we are, we should try to minimize their, their, their role. Um, so I was, I was and I, it's a general fact about the literature you might want to, to comment yes. on it. There's sometimes a confusion about this three concept, is, must, should. I think you're entirely right. I think that applies not only to the feminist um, kind of approach, but in mu much more generally. And I think this is a, a topic that has been, I'd say, under sort of explored, under theorized. Um, in principle, there's the question of whether a there is a kind of um, implication from a descriptive claim about how values influence um, scientists and people in general or in, a, in epistemological context. Um, whether that then implies something about how they should reason. Um, and there's a kind of, a, I think, a, a very general question which I have not seen much uh, discussion in, in this context. For sure, there's some discussion in general epistemology. Um, I think in particular, there's the question of like how much of a, uh, wh whether if you think that at some point, if implementing an ideal or, or a, a values is not feasible, how, um, how much of that infeasibility is such that it really undermines the ideal? I think most people would say that at some point, um, if the value, if the, the ideal state of affairs is just completely infeasible, then you should be um, sort of wary of it. And at the very least, think about sort of how should we approximate it? Should it really be governing our actions and so on? But there's very little thinking about that. I myself think that there's a kind of asymmetry in the sense that a lot of um, value, uh, people who support value freedom have tended to be a bit of a, a bit optimistic about how uh, the extent to which scientists are able to free themselves of the influence of values. And people on the other side have been pessimistic. But we should probably examine 
the situation under optimistic uh, uh, assumptions on, on both sides or under pessimistic assumptions on both sides, probably pessimistic, I think. But uh, at any rate, the sort of the, the field should be level here. Um, so, so that's another kind of no, that's not right, and I, I will uh, flag out something you said because that's one of the themes of the conference. The fact that people outside the philosophy of science have looked at issues that are definitely relevant for the discussion of um, values in science, and, and you mentioned uh, general epistemologists who have been very concerned about the role of practical considerations in on the ascription of knowledge or the possession of knowledge. And that's definitively a place where the discussion of uh, values in science would benefit, in fact, from reaching out to uh, the rest of, of philosophy. Um, maybe you want to say a few things about that now? Or? Um, sure, we, we can talk about that. Um, I, I think, yes, in general, I think this discussion of values in science has been relatively insulated from definitely other parts of philosophy outside of philosophy of science, to some extent also from other parts of philosophy of science. Um, and I think that, I to an extent, it's understandable. There was a sort of state of affairs in which there was a, a dominant kind of mainstream, often implicit uh, understanding of the interaction between values and science. There was a certain reaction to it. That reaction really focused on a set of particular claims and ideas. And it's understandable that, you know, people who pioneered that tried to make a certain point and and uh, generate a certain shift in, a, in thinking about that. And, but I think we're at a point where it makes sense um, and is desirable, I think, uh, to sort of climb out of that sort of uh, that um, uh, part of the debate and uh, sort of think about which art other parts of philosophy can contribute here. You've mentioned epistemology. I definitely think there's work in epistemology, both on the kind of thing I mentioned before, the interaction between descriptive and normative, ideas about like, does ought imply can in epistemic matters and h how exactly and why, um, but also other aspects of epistemology. For instance, there's a huge discussion in general epistemology on um, uh, pragmatic and moral encroachment. Those are issues that have some structural parallels to issues in um, values and science debates. There are others, we can talk about others, including um, relationships between um, this part of philosophy of science and parts of political philosophy and moral philosophy, where there's concepts and ideas that are at least relevant, if not, you know, quite parallel. Um, let's, let's get back to that question in a, f in a, f in a few minutes. Uh, before that, I wanted to uh, ask you two questions. The first one is that you mentioned the pioneers in the emergence of what we've described as a consensus in philosophy of science. Could you just give us maybe a few names here uh, for people listening to this podcast? Right, so I mentioned uh, kind of three sources of, of the, the move towards a more value-laden picture. I think on the feminist side, you can definitely mention um, people like Helen Longino, who's done a lot in general and generally in feminist philosophy of science, and in this topic in particular. Elizabeth Anderson is another writer who's been um, also connected this to some questions in political philosophy. Her work has been very influential. Um, Sandra Harding and some other sort of uh, I'd say more general uh, uh, feminist philosophers of science and epistemology have, have exerted an influence here as well. Um, the notion of the thick concepts and their sort of relevance to science was mentioned earlier on in by people like John Dupre. And more recently, I think uh, important work has been done by Anna Alexandrova, who has worked on this in the context of social science, especially in um, uh, the Science of Well-Being, as she calls it. She's got a paper and a recent book on this, which are, are very interesting and influential. Um, and I think the person, maybe the person who's been uh, most influential in recent years has been Heather Douglas. Heather's written um, a bunch of papers and uh, a book on this, and she's been influential also in terms of organizing the community. So um, uh, Heather Douglas and alongside her, people like uh, Matt Brown and Kevin Elliott have been uh, very influential in not just uh, on the ideas level, but also on the level of sort of the community and having a kind of um, d structured debate and structured community around these issues. Thank you. Um, the other question I wanted to ask is, uh, we've talked about the consensus, you've expressed some um, concerns or, 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 or li new lines of discussion, but what is your view on, on the matter? That, that's a good question, <laughs> and, and uh, I don't think I can give you a one-liner. Um, I'd say it's evolving. Uh, 
Uh, and I, I do think that there's more room uh, for um, value-free conceptions, especially at the level of individuals. The idea that individuals should, uh, so to speak, bear the burden of making value judgments seems to me often to be to uh, overestimate their the ability of individuals and underestimate the dangers of them. Uh, so I think that's one place where I think there a lot a lot of the discussion, especially in in kind of more core philosophy of science, is focused on individuals, and I think has uh, tended to portray an make an implausible set of assumptions about how individual epistemology works in this context and what can be expected. Another line which I sort of tend to be, I don't know if it's exactly dissent, but it's more uh, concern, is I think there's been a presumption in a lot of this uh, literature that science operates uh, within dem democratic societies and within a uh, certain kind of, um, you know, n normatively unproblematic contexts. And I think that's simply not true, both in the world right now, certainly historically, a lot of science uh, was done in non-democratic and still is and will be looking forward into the future in non-democratic societies. And that both raises questions in and of itself, but also sort of might challenge some of the assumptions under which uh, present day uh, discussions are held. So I think those are two things that have been sort of um, increasingly concerning for me. Um, and a third thing, it kind of relates to what we were talking about before, this notion that while you might really f accept the idea that there are challenges to the feasibility of various um, value-neutral pictures, and I think that's a very compelling argument uh, made along those lines, it's not obvious what follows from that on the normative uh, side. Um, and the question of you know, how do you approximate various ideals, and more generally the kind of Distinction, this is another area of contact with political philosophy, uh, the kind of distinction between ideal and non-ideal situations and how the norms in one should relate to the norms in the other. Um, I think that's there's a lot to say there, and I'm not convinced that because of feasibility considerations, we should abandon the ideal uh, picture of, of science as, at least in some level, uh, value neutral. Um. You mentioned non the fact that science is made in, has made, is made, will be made in non-democratic societies. I think that's true, obviously. It's also, it's also, it's also worth pointing uh, to the fact that much of science these days is done by private companies. And uh, in fact, um, people might not know, but much of scientific funding is in fact private in, in, in North America. Um, and that does seem to be relevant to the question of the place of values in science because um, uh, no democratic norms on choosing values for a society might not apply in the same way for choosing values in the context of private science. Right. I, I agree, and, and, and those both of those facts are important descriptively and normatively, to, to both the norms and the, the descriptive sort of um, pressures, the incentives that people are under, and so on. Uh, differ in these contexts. It's also worth just mentioning um, an obvious but like super important fact here, and that is science. Uh, there's a, there's a collaboration. There's a the scientific community. Uh, let's put it this way: um, is crosses borders. So the scientific community in non-democratic countries and democratic countries, in private and public settings, is one and the same in many ways. So. You have to at least think about that when you think about the fact that you know uh, norms should sh the normative. Let's put it this way: the normative picture overall should say something about how the scientific community, given this kind of heterogeneity, should uh, work and what sort of norms should govern it. Yeah, these are all fascinating questions, and as you mentioned earlier, many of them have not been tackled in any way by uh, the existing debate about science and values. And when's the point of the conference? Uh, you know, I think that this is one of the many topics uh, that we hope to discuss in now a few weeks from, from, from today. Um, what other question do you think we should be concerned with? We mentioned uh, a few already. Uh, you mentioned political science and the connection between science and values and political science or political philosophy. Do you want to elaborate a bit on that? Uh, I'll say one thing which I think um, where there's a, a certain, I think, 
largely a consensus, I would say almost a universal agreement, that there's one place in the science values interface where uh, there's, there's no question that, that values uh, and social political considerations influence uh, science, and that's in setting the agenda. So in asking what science should we fund, what should we study, where should resources go and where should they not go, I think there's going to be very few people who will deny that s society has at least a big uh, say in that. Surprisingly, though, uh, while this is a major topic in some political science debates uh, at the policy level and at the institutional level, philosophers have had very little to say about this. I think the only main sort of extended treatment of that occurs in uh, Philip Kitcher, uh, especially in a couple of books, one from 2001 and one from 2011. Uh, Kitcher presents a, a very specific sort of deliberative democracy type of, of view. Uh, it's very interesting, but there are many other options, and that that view in general has not been uh, uh, taken up and debated in, in any uh, serious way, and I think that's unfortunate. There's a lot to do here. There's, a, there's many questions about how um, science funding in a kind of very broad sense of what the agenda that society seeks uh, f uh, for science should interact with specific funding mechanisms, with questions about the social epistemological aspects of science. Um, and so that's a, big, that's a big area. It's definitely a place where philosophy of science could matter to um, something that's not philosophy of science, namely policy. Uh, you know, I suppose if we had sophisticated thoughts about how to proceed with respect to properly funding uh, science, uh, policymakers might actually be interested. Uh, um, uh, so that it's, it looks like a missed opportunity in, yes, in many I ways. I, I definitely agree. Uh, an, an, uh, another place where it could matter, uh, where philosophy could matter and philosophy of science could matter is in thinking more about uh, trust. Trust within science and trust between science and the public. Um, and this is an area that's received somewhat more attention uh, but again, this attention has been um, largely kind of uh, reliant on the resources that philosophy of science has. Um, but there is a pretty interesting literature on trust in epistemology and moral philosophy. Some of it is relevant. Uh, some of it uh, sketches out concepts of trust that might be relevant or concepts of trust that might contrast in important ways with the sort of trust, sorts of trust we see within science and between science and, and the public. So that I think that's another area which where there's a lot more room for kind of dialogue with other parts of philosophy. And I think that there's a lot of uh, thinking within, um, you know, various public bodies and policy bodies about how to increase uh, trust in science uh, in the public, public trust in science in particular. And I think those discussions could v definitely benefit from a more sophisticated sort of conceptual toolkit which might come from these uh, discussions. So moving a little bit beyond uh, the topic of values in science, let's try to see how it connects to, how that topic connects to bro the broader philosophy of science. So what are the implications of the topic of value in science for the rest maybe of philosophy of science? I mean, there could be various uh, points of context and implications. Um, for instance, I mentioned the arguments from inductive risk. Uh, there are related arguments that rely on ideas of underdetermination and the idea that because of various gaps between evidence and theory, there's room for values to enter. Uh, you could definitely see how those uh, issues would interact with questions about confirmation, which has there's a, a large, as you know, a large and sophisticated literature on that. Um, there's not much of that. There's uh, w one way of combating arguments from inductive risk, one classic way has been to rely on Bayesian epistemology, but there's not much of a development of how that would look, uh, what whether the Bayesian picture really fits, uh, or if it doesn't, whether other pictures do fit. On the side of people who think that um, you know, the, the sort of gap between evidence and theory is and should be a place where values enter, there's not, I think, been a, a, a lot of theorizing about how does that thing look? What exactly is the interaction between values and evidence uh, uh, looks like? A and I think that's an area where it's, it's both implications for how we think about confirmation, 
and uh, empirical adequacy in general and influence in the other direction from theories of confirmation into the values in science discussion. Um, I think another area is just a kind of question about what are the goals of science, right? Um, you often increasingly maybe even see discussions about what does science aim at truth? Does it aim at empirical adequacy? Does it aim at something like understanding? Um, and, and there's a big question about what is the relationship between that and between practical and um, um, value-based uh, goals of science? Because obviously in society, we at the very least in part want uh, science to aim at truths that are socially significant. We want science to inform us about policy-relevant questions, about climate, about the environment, about you know public health issues, and so on. How do goals of science in that sense relate to goals in science in the sort of more epistemic sense that philosophers of science are usually concerned with? Um, and maybe a third thing, I think, is the notion of scientific objectivity. How, what is objectivity uh, in general is a, a huge question for philosophy of science, and the extent to which science can be objective if it is value-laden, I think is something that there's a, there's a lot to say about. It's not that nothing has been said on this, but there's a lot to say about that, and uh, uh, that would be a, a big sort of um, set of implications there. So to conclude, maybe to bring this uh, uh, podcast to an end, um, maybe you want to say something about your the future direction of your own work, what you are working on now, and uh, what you will be working on in this area in, in the coming years or months. Yeah, thanks. Uh, like I said, I mean, a, a lot of this is still evolving for me, and uh, if, you, if you talk to me a year from now, I might give a somewhat different answer. We answers. will. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the moment, I've been concerned with the question of really the two of the things that I mentioned before. One is the level of individuals and how much of the sort of, even if you accept that values should enter or can at least uh, enter into some scientific scientific practices, uh, w should this be thought of as operating at the individual level? And I'm somewhat concerned about this. And I think that the idea of entrusting a lot of the sort of values-based decisions uh, at the hands of individuals has uh, definite problems, and I've, tr I've tried to sort of articulate those problems. And another thing is this idea of pessimism versus optimism. Um, and here I tend to emphasize the pessimistic side, partly because I think we should. I think we should be somewhat pessimistic about um, the extent to which people in general, scientists in particular, are influenced by values and how able they are, uh, how much they are able to handle and sort of live up to various ideals. Uh, and partly because I think, as I mentioned before, this has not been thought about. I mean, there's been a kind of, I think, in many ways, a kind of a optimistic assumption on both sides of these debates, uh, and I think it's at least worth exploring the pessimistic side. So those are two things I'm currently working and thinking o about. Uh, but like I said, I mean, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's going to change uh, over time. All right, thank you very very much for this uh, uh, wonderful discussion, and uh, I'll uh, see you maybe at a conference in a few um, um, uh, weeks from now. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>